When it's done right, a crispy, golden beefsteak bathed in rich white gravy is the very definition of carby indulgence. So let's consult the experts and learn how to craft the most delicious at-home version of chicken fried steak. When it comes to southern comfort food, it doesn't get much better than chicken fried steak. However, whipping up this dish for yourself can prove tougher than you might think. Breading and frying the steak is straightforward enough, and making a white gravy is also pretty easy. But where the challenge really lies is in making a chicken fried steak as delicious as the kind you'd find at a restaurant. Fortunately for you, we went straight to the experts to discover their insider secrets. With the help of Derek Long, the executive chef at Oklahoma's Flint Kitchen and Bar, and Bob Bennett, the executive chef at Zingerman's Roadhouse in Ann Arbor, Michigan, you'll be whipping up a top-tier chicken fried steak in no time. Buttermilk is absolutely key for high-quality chicken fried steak. Thanks to its natural, mild acid, it tenderizes the meat without altering the texture and also leaves it extra juicy. To maximize its usefulness, sometimes the meat is even left to marinate in buttermilk for several hours in the refrigerator before it's dipped in the breading and then fried. According to Bob Bennett, I am pretty in love with the way we make it at Zingerman's Roadhouse. First, we dip it in buttermilk, then we coat it in seasoned flour. Soaking steak in buttermilk also helps the seasoned flour adhere to the meat. Eggs are interchangeably used for this step at a lot of restaurants. As Bennett explains, a lot of the time it is the three-step process of flour, egg, and then breadcrumbs. However, it's worth noting that the protein found in eggs tends to expand in the hot oil, which often leads to loose or flaky breading. Buttermilk reacts differently in the heat which helps the breading actually stay on the chicken fried steak and not stick stubbornly to the pan. If you want a flavorful, crispy steak, you'll need to approach the breading process with plenty of TLC. According to Derek Long, this typically involves a double flour breading. This isn't overly complicated or time-consuming, and it can make a huge difference. First, dredge the steak in the breading mixture, then put it back into the buttermilk and dip it one more time into the breading. That second buttermilk dip is important because without it, the double layer of breading will have nothing to adhere to. I love bread. Once you're done, we recommend gently shaking off the excess and letting this second layer of breading sit for a moment before rushing to cook the steaks. Giving the meat a chance to absorb the extra moisture reduces the risk of your breading falling off while frying. You can even repeat this breading step for a third time, which will increase the thickness of the steak's outer layer and, in turn, make it even crispier. In some ways, chicken fried steak is a lot like schnitzel, as the meat needs to be extra thin before it's breaded and fried. And that's worth noting because, according to Derek Long, we should all be taking our cues from traditional German cuisine and hammering our meat, ideally with a tenderizer or a meat hammer. As he explains, I always tenderize my meats with a hammer in the back until they are about half an inch thick. If you don't have a tenderizer, the end of a rolling pin or the bottom of a cast iron skillet will get the job done in a pinch. You could also use heavy sealed cans or the underside of a chopping board. Whatever you use, thinning out the beef will break up some of its connective tissues, making for a juicier, more tender steak. It also makes it much easier for the beef to absorb herbs and spices seriously boosting the final dish's flavor profile. While tenderizing is important, that doesn't mean that you should start hammering your steak into smithereens. As Derek Long warns, don't overwork the chicken fry steak in the tenderizing process or it will fall apart. Over-tenderizing the meat can ruin its structural integrity, and it could also dramatically increase your odds of overcooking. By its very nature, a thin chicken fried steak is going to cook quicker than most cuts of meat. If you make it too thin, it's more likely that you'll end up with a dry, tough, flavorless, depressingly gray slab of meat. To avoid this, take it slow and steady with the tenderizer. And don't leave the final thickness up to chance either. Pause regularly to check if you're getting close to that half-inch goal. And be sure to aim for consistent thickness across the entire cutlet so that you don't end up with an unevenly cooked steak. Flavorful chicken fried steak doesn't happen by accident. The professionals treat their seasoning like a science, and they don't exactly go light with the herbs or spices. Everyone has their personal preferences, but Derek Long's standard selection consists of garlic powder, black pepper, onion powder, and paprika. Paprikans. <laughs> I love paprikans. 
Bob Bennett's go-to combo of salt, pepper, and cayenne has a little bit more of a kick, with the latter doing most of the heavy lifting. Even if this blend doesn't sound ideal for your taste buds, the most important takeaway is that there's no one right way to season your chicken fried steak, so don't be afraid to experiment. You can certainly never go wrong with classics like garlic or oregano, or if you're feeling a bit more adventurous, try adding corn chips to the mix for an extra crunch. If you're a spice lover, you can also try whipping up a Nashville hot chicken fried steak, a hybrid that uses up to three tablespoons of cayenne pepper, plus a splash or two of hot sauce in the buttermilk marinade. Salt is a key element in most savory dishes, especially something like chicken fried steak. From the meat to the breading to the gravy, it's a pillar in every single step of the chicken fried steak prep process. Derek Long specifically recommends kosher salt, which is known for its purity. If you want to take it a step further, you can also opt to dry brine your steak ahead of marinating and frying. This involves rubbing the steak with salts and leaving it to rest, which gives the salt time to dissolve meat proteins, draw out moisture, and form a gel that improves the steak's ability to then reabsorb and retain the moisture. Just like tenderizing, this can go a long way in improving the juiciness of your chicken fried steak. It can also improve its overall flavor, especially if you get a head start on your seasoning by adding some of your favorite herbs as well as salt. Some people serve their chicken fried steak with green beans, while others pair it with a baked potato, french fries, or rice. At Flint Kitchen & Bar, it's served with whipped potatoes. Whatever side you choose, one thing that's non-negotiable is that you need to add plenty of thick, white country gravy. There are a few ways you can whip this up at home, but if you want to do it like Bob Bennett, you need to focus on perfecting the creamy texture. He suggests making a stock and then thickening it with roux. Alternatively, you could follow Derek Long's approach, who notes, I'm a big fan of enriching the gravy with a heavy cream to add a little more body to the gravy, and I always thicken it with a traditional blonde roux. To make a blonde roux, all you need is butter and flour. You melt the butter, and then the flour is whisked into the butter over a low heat for up to five minutes until it adopts a slightly nutty flavor. Long also recommends mixing in simple seasonings such as salt and black pepper, the latter of which is what gives Southern gravy its recognizable black flex. One of the reasons that chicken fried steak may hit harder in a restaurant than at home is because some chefs are using much more than salt and pepper to season their gravy. Much like the seasoning of the beef steak, this step depends a lot on personal preference, which is why Bob Bennett suggests being experimental with your herbs and spices. If you don't know where to begin, a good place to start is with ground black pepper, garlic powder, and cayenne pepper. Other tasty additions to consider include thyme and onion powder. If you're feeling extra adventurous, you can also throw in a splash of hot sauce, Worcestershire sauce, meat drippings, or lard. The latter is often swapped in for butter in traditional Southern gravy, thanks to its improved ability to thicken the sauce. They're expecting me to memorize 22 different types of lard. Considering how thin a chicken fried steak is, you can easily cook it in a pan with a shallow amount of oil and still end up with a delicious dish. But some people find that this causes the exterior to brown unevenly. If you want a truly indulgent, crunchy exterior, you'll need to deep fry your steak whether in an actual deep fryer or in a deep cast iron skillet filled with several inches of oil. The trick to doing this properly is placing each steak into the hot oil and frying for several minutes. You'll then want to flip the steak in the oil, preferably at a temperature of around 375 degrees Fahrenheit, and cook it on the opposite side for the same amount of time. Depending on the size of your fryer or skillet, you may want to fry each steak separately. Overcrowding may lead to accidentally steaming the steak, which could negatively impact the crispiness of the outer layer. Thanks to the breading, it's usually pretty obvious when the steak is done, as the exterior takes on a golden brown hue and a crispy texture. Meanwhile, the interior temperature should hit around 145 degrees Fahrenheit, which is right on the cusp of medium and medium well. Die-hard meat lovers know that not all steaks are equal, and when you're making chicken fried steak, you need to be even more selective with the right cuts to get the best results possible. While you can make do with a sliced, tenderized piece of any steak, the most common recommendation is a tenderized slice of rump roast, also known as a cube steak. If you want the kind served up at Flint Kitchen & Bar, you'll need to follow Derek Long's lead and track down a terry measure, which is a small cut taken from the shoulder that's known for its flavor. This isn't necessarily easy to come by, though, as terry measure is primarily sold at butcher's shops instead of grocery stores. But if it's a quality chicken fried steak you're after, then you should ideally be picking up your meat at a butcher's shop anyway. 
As Bob Bennett explains, the quality of the product we start with is better than what most folks buy at the grocery store. The good news, though, is that it is possible to find the good stuff. Finding a local butcher that knows their stuff is a really good start. After all the effort put into frying the chicken fried steak, it can certainly be frustrating to return for round two. But this could make all the difference between average and delicious. Me want food! To do it right, you'll need to take the chicken fried steak out of the oil as normal in round one. Leave it to cool for several minutes, preferably on a wire rack, before plunging it back into the oil for a second frying session to remove even more moisture from the breading. Again, once you're done, we suggest leaving it to cool on a wire rack so we can get rid of the extra oil as it trickles off, which will otherwise lead to a soggy batter if left to pool on the chicken fried steak. The whole process may sound laborious, but it's worth the effort for a wonderfully crunchy finish.